Okay, I'm delighted now to introduce Imogen Cavadino, who's going to talk to us about the about slugs in Britain, uh, slimy, sticky, and unloved. Uh, not unloved by everybody, though, Imogen. Definitely not. I, I love <laughs> slugs personally, but um, by the end of this talk, I'm sure everybody will agree that slugs should not be unloved. Uh, I won't give too detailed an introduction to Imogen. I'll let her tell you about her experience herself, but I have actually seen a version of this talk before and you're in for a real delight. So over to you, Imogen. Thanks, Kieran. Um, so before I get started today, I should apologise. My neighbours are doing some DIY. Hopefully my microphone will not pick up the banging, but if you do hear any banging in the background, I'm, I must apologise. There's very little I can do about that. My talk does also come with a PG rating. We will be talking about the wonderful world of slug sex at some point. So just bear that in mind as well if you've got any children with you today. So hopefully today um, I will inspire you to learn to appreciate slugs a little bit more and look at them again with new eyes, particularly if you like me, you are a gardener. So in this talk, I'm going to start with a little bit about me and my background and my research, and then we'll dive into what actually makes a slug, why I think slugs are so fascinating, so various things about them, um, some interesting slugs for you to all go out and look for at some point, and how you can actually get started with recording some slugs yourself. But before we get started, I always like to kind of get an idea of what people know about slugs already. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop this link in the chat for you. You can click on this. It will take you to a website where you can create these little sticky notes and put them on the board. And you can just tell me everything you know about slugs already there. So I'll just pop that in the chat for you there. So that will be there for throughout the whole talk. And we will come back to this at the end. And then you can tell me then what you've learned about slugs during the talk today. OK. So hopefully you've all clicked on that link, um, but while you're looking at that, I will carry on talking for a little while. So a bit about me. So I have a master's in conservation ecology. So my background is kind of about the conservation of um, animals. Um, and during that time, I did a little bit of study on slugs, but not a lot. But that actually led to then doing a natural talent traineeship with the National Museum of Wales in Cardiff, where I uh, spent some time with the national expert, learning all about how to identify slugs, snails and freshwater snails and bivalves as well. So that was quite an intensive year of that. Um, and that eventually led on to what I'm doing now, which is my PhD with the Royal Horticultural Society and Newcastle University, which is all based around the idea of understanding slugs and snails diversity a little bit better and understanding the role they play in the garden. I'm also now also a council member for the Conchological Society of Britain and Ireland. Um, so I have quite a strong interest in these groups and love coming to events like this to try and promote them and get people excited about them as well, because they are a bit of an understudied and a little bit of an unloved group as well. But of course, I am actually a gardener as well. So there is a bit of a conflict of interest as well in that I do love gardens. Um, I love gardening. I love growing plants. Um, and that's not always very compatible with slugs and snails. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about my research before we dive into the wonderful world of slugs, just to give you an idea of what I do day to day. So my PhD actually has three main strands of research. We've got the RHS Cellar Slug Survey, which I will be talking about later on in the talk, which you can all get involved in and all contribute to, which is fantastic. Uh, we also have the Slugs Camp Project, which I'm gonna go talk a little bit about more in a moment. Um, and also I do a bit of work looking at feeding preferences of slug species to try and evidence which ones are pests and which ones are not in the garden, because not all slugs are equal. So a bit about Slugs Count. Um, uh, this is just a shameless plug, really. Um, so this is a big project that we're running at the moment. We've got 60 people all around the UK. You can see these little green dots on the map of mainland Britain here. So these dedicated volunteers are actually going out once a month at the moment um, to collect slugs for 30 minutes and then identify them to species. So it's a huge effort. Um, already by December, we'd identified 4,000 slugs between us. So we're seeing a huge amount of slugs and it's telling us an absolutely massive amount about the slugs in our garden. So we're learning a huge amount about what species are where and more about some of the introduced species, but also some of the native ones as well. Um, so this is a closed project. The results of this should be coming out in 2022. So watch this space. Hopefully we'll have lots of exciting things to say about slugs at that time. Okay, so that was a little bit about me and my research. 
So what is a slug? Well, slugs actually belong to the phylum or group of invertebrates known as the mollusca. And this includes many organisms and some of the oldest organisms on the planet in some cases. So things like octopus, squid, clams, scallops, oysters, chitons, they all belong to the same group, the mollusca, that slugs and snails also belong to. So within that, um, slugs and snails belong to the class gastropoda, gastro meaning stomach, poda meaning foot. This is related to the way that they appear to crawl around on their stomachs. What ties this entire group together as the mollusca is actually this fleshy area known as the mantle, which can look very different on different um, members of this group. But we'll be coming back to this a little bit later on um, when we talk about slugs, because um, the position of that is quite interesting. And also a lot of these have a remnant or some kind of shell and slugs are no exception to that. So what makes a slug different to a snail? Well, essentially they are actually part of the same group of animals. Um, so uh, the artificial grouping, the grouping of slugs separately is actually a little bit artificial in some ways, um, but we do tend to look at them a bit differently because of they do have some different characters. Slugs actually evolved from snails originally. So snail is the original form. And over time, they shrunk and simplified their core shells right, right down so that they've been reduced to, um, in some cases, just a fingernail like process held within the body. And in other cases, just a granular like dust again inside the body. This process has happened many, many times over, over the past, producing different families of slugs. So in fact, some family of slugs are more closely related to other snail species than they are other slug species, which is quite interesting. The shell is usually internal, but there are some exceptions, and we will be talking about these later on. Slugs only make up about a third of all the terrestrial mollusk species in Britain, the rest being snails. So it's actually a relatively small group, but it's really interesting and quite challenging group to get to grips with and to study, and quite exciting as well. But it's not always easy being a slug or a snail, because the biggest threat is actually just drying out. So between 70 to 90% of a slug's body is thought to be water-based. So they're very, very dependent on moisture for survival. Snails have a bit of an advantage because shells can provide a huge amount of protection from um, water loss and evaporation, as well as from predators, of course. Snails can also produce a nice protective layer over the shell mouth in really tough, dry conditions, like this snail at the top here, um, known as the epiphram. And this can actually help prevent even more water loss when it's really hot and dry conditions. So that gives them a nice bit of protection. So slugs are a bit more vulnerable because they don't have this shell for protection anymore, really. However, they do have the advantage of having lost this big, bulky, heavy shell. They can actually cr crawl down into small cracks in the soil um, and actually wait out tough conditions there. Some of them will actually produce mucus lined little cells and just sit and wait there until the conditions improve. And they can actually respond very quickly to changes in environmental conditions. For example, things like rain, they can very quickly uh, recover from really dry conditions and get back out and about when the conditions are better. They also have this lovely defensive slime, which helps, again, keep them from drying out completely. So their whole body is just coated in slime, essentially. And this is at least 90% water. The rest is made up of complex proteins, um, which have really interesting properties. In fact, um, there's a lot of research being done on some of these, and they've been looking at things like using them as medical grade adhesives, things like that, because it just has such incredible properties. But for slugs themselves, this provides a huge amount of protection. So they're essentially just crawling around on this nice puddle of slime that they create and leave behind them. But they do produce several different types of slime as well. So they have this nice one for movement. They glide over surfaces and it's very effective. It means that they um, can be protected from any surface they're crawling on. So like the snail at the top is demonstrating very nicely, they can actually do things like crawl over razor blades because they're not coming into contact with the, the sharp edge itself. The slime has given them so much protection. However, in slugs cases, they will also produce at least one different type of mucus for defense. 
And the color of this can actually be quite diagnostic and useful for identification. So for example, this slug at the bottom here, if you irritate it gently, it would actually produce a bright orange slime from its body. This is quite a fine powdery type of slime and you can actually rub it into your fingers quite nicely, but it will stain them bright orange. And um, we actually use this as an ID character for that species in particular. So that's the dusky slug, Arin subfuscus. However, the slime it used to move around is clear. So you can see there's a big difference in the slime type. But on top of drying out, you've also got the challenge of so many things wanting to eat you. Um, so these are just a few things I've pulled out of scientific literature that's been published of um, things known to use slugs and snails in their diet. Some of these are quite generalist animals, um, so things like reptiles and amphibians will also feed on slugs and snails, um, whereas others are very specialist. So you've got a whole group of flies known as the snail killing flies, which are dependent on slugs and snails for their life cycle, but also things at the bottom here, like the glowworm. So the glowworm larvae is very much dependent on a diet of snails as it's growing up. Um, so without any snails, there would probably be no glowworm larvae. But then also you have members of your own group trying to eat you. So at the top here, we've actually got a picture of a smaller snail species predating a larger snail species. So that is actually feeding on the other snail in that photo. So Everything out there trying to eat you, even things like badgers and foxes will um, use snails and slugs to supplement their diets. So it really is a tough, tough uh, world out there for slugs and snails. And it gets even harder because people like us who garden will often get quite angry at you for being a slug and you'll be accused of things that you haven't done. So I've actually pulled this uh, little screenshot from a gardening website. I've not named them intentionally because I didn't want to name and shame them. Um, these are apparently the most harmful slugs in the garden. So at the top here, we've actually got on the top left, Arian hortensis, uh, which is the blue black soil slug. This can indeed be quite a major pest of plants, um, particularly things like root vegetables, it can cause a bit of a problem with. So it's not, not necessarily a friendly slug for us. Then on the right here, we've got Durosaurus reticulatum, or the netted field slug. This is a really common slug to find absolutely everywhere across the UK. It's one of the most common slugs in agriculture as well to cause problems with crops. So yes, probably causing a lot of damage in gardens as well. However, at the bottom here, we actually have Limicus maculatus, the uh, green cellar slug, which I'll be talking about later on again. These are not harmful to garden plants at all. Um, occasionally they might just go for some very um, some fruit so things like strawberry fruits occasionally they have been seen to attack them but it's very very rare for this to actually be the case in fact most of the time they feed on rotting material and things like fungi like our algae as well so they're actually kind of the good slugs of the garden in that they're helping break material down and recycle nutrients back into the soil so to call it one of the most harmful slugs is a bit a bit mean and it just kind of goes to show that most gardeners and most people think a slug is a slug and don't necessarily know a lot more about them. And in fact, diet is quite complex when it comes to slugs. So at least 17% of slugs are thought to be fungivorous, meaning that they only really feed on things like fungi for survival. So very specialized diets. And you've also got 12% that are actually carnivorous. So they'll feed exclusively on things like earthworms. So they spend their whole lives in the soil feeding on earthworms. It's quite rare to actually see them. So you can see at the bottom left here, here's one that we actually found out on field work. And it's actually regurgitated its meal of a worm into my hand here um, because we've disturbed it. So it really does go to show that they, they do feed on earthworms. <laughs> Um, whereas 26% are herbivores, we know for sure that they just feed on things like plants. However, that's a bit more complicated within that in that we don't necessarily know if they feed just on live plant material or if they will also feed on rotting plants as well. And in fact, it's thought that many slug species might prefer to feed on rotting plant material than live material in some cases. So very difficult question to try and answer there because it's quite hard to do an experiment um, looking at that. 
But then we have another 28% that are the omnivores. So like this slug at the top here on, on the left, um, they will feed on pretty much anything they come across. So that can be your live tender plants that you're trying to gr you're growing lovingly from seed. Unfortunately, they will go for them, but also will include things like dog poo, dead animals, uh, decaying plant material, other dead slugs. So again, kind of a beneficial role in some ways in that they are really helping break things down. Um, but also they are attacking our, our tender plants and things like that as well. So it's so a bit of a mixed, mixed reputation, those ones. So I have a quick poll for you. So I was wondering, do you think slugs and snails have teeth? Kieran, would you be able to launch this poll? Thank you. So I'll give you a, a few seconds to respond. Just to let everybody know, it is anonymous. So if you get it wrong, We'll never know that it was you that got it wrong. Um, no judgment here. But, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, no judgment whatsoever. So, oh, wow, they're answering quickly, Imogen. I think yeah, it's very fast. I've ever seen. So then we'll end it in five seconds. Um, Stephen Green has asked, how are we defining teeth? Oh, <laughs> well. <laughs> we'll leave that up to the people. Yeah. The yeah. <laughs> Some kind of dentition, I suppose. Lovely. Yeah. So 75% of people agree that slugs do have teeth. And yes, you are correct. They do indeed have teeth. In fact, they have thousands of them. Um, how many kind of depends on the species, um, but there's usually thousands. And these actually appear on a tongue like process known as the radula in which they'll be arranged in rows. So they actually have different shaped teeth which kind of reflect the diets they have. So on the left here, we've got a species that feeds mainly on kind of decaying material, but also will do things like scrape algae off hard surfaces. So they have at least two different shaped teeth which seem to reflect different purposes. Um, so maybe one will be for grinding, grinding up um, plant material they've ingested, and maybe the others will be more to, for scraping away at hard surfaces, I suppose. However, this species on the right here has a very different arrangement of teeth. This is one of the earthworm feeding species. So you can kind of see that they're arranged in these chevron like rows that kind of come down into the middle, creating this nice little funnel in the middle to help kind of pull the earthworm into the slug's mouth. So this process um, is used a little bit like a cheese gracer in a way. So they actually have this tongue like process known as the radula in their mouth. They'll then use a complex arrangement of muscles to push this outside of the mouth, scrape it against the surface and pull whatever they're feeding on back into the mouth um, in that way. The carnivorous species it acts a little bit more differently. It's a bit more like a chainsaw in a way and kind of revolves around, its, around itself a bit. It's quite interesting. But generally most uh, slug and snail feeding is like the diagram on the screen here. This can leave behind some distinctive patterns, particularly if they're feeding on algae on a surface. So you can see a lovely photo example of that here. In theory, it is possible to actually identify slugs and snails from this fe these feeding patterns because the teeth will leave different patterns behind. However, I'm not aware of anyone who currently has the expertise to do this, um, but it's quite interesting to, to think that that is the case. So along with surprising teeth, they also have surprising sex live slugs. So all slugs are actually hermaphroditic, meaning that they are both male and female at the same time. So finding a partner is usually pretty straightforward in that any member of your species is technically the right gender for you to reproduce with. Um, however, it's uh, sometimes you don't even have to stick within the same species, but that's another, another complication to talk to about at another time. The mating habits do vary a lot between different species groups um, and co courtship is often quite a complicated affair. There is a bit of a sexual arms race going on within the slugs in that they have developed various techniques to try and be more successful as a male or female um, in different roles. And foreplay is quite an important part of that. So, um, for example, this slug at the top here in the middle, this is the netted field slug. These actually have quite a complicated drawn out courtship process in that they will actually use this special little process sticking out the side of the head here. 
and they will stroke this gently along their partner's back to try and entice them in the mood, into the mood of mating. It's actually thought that this is also transferring hormones to make them more successful um, in terms of mating. But it's also just quite interesting to see because they're gently caressing each other with these processes. Um, if the partner's in the mood, they'll actually reciprocate the same behavior. And while they're doing this, they'll circle round and round each other at the same time. At a certain point in time, um, one of them will then start biting the other one's tail. They will then start thrashing around in response to the biting and slapping each other across the face. Don't really understand why they do this, but it's always part of the mating process. Um, this will go on for a few more seconds and then they'll go back to gently stroking each other. And this cycle will continue for a good 30 minutes to an hour. So it's quite a long drawn out process and very complicated. Others, uh, maybe a bit more famous, is the leopard slug. These actually produce these long mucus ropes from things like trees or walls. They'll hang down from those, wind their bodies around each other, and then extrude the genitalia below their bodies. So you can see this kind of bluish mass at the bottom there. Um, and we'll exchange sperm then. Once mating is over, they'll drop to the ground in some cases and crawl off, or in other cases, they'll actually just crawl back up that mucus rope consuming it as they go. So again, very bizarre behaviors. Whereas other groups, it's a bit less spectacular looking. They'll just kind of crawl around each other a little bit, create this little ball and extrude the genitalia below them. Generally, most um, mating seems to happen with the genitals outside of the body. But along with strange sexual behaviors, they also have very strange unexplained behaviors that are defensive behaviors, we think. So for example, um, you may have seen around in your garden or around outside when you've been walking around, if there's a nice shower of rain, some slugs might come out and about, particularly these big brown or black ones with bright orange fringes around the edge or dull orange fringes in some case. These actually are a complex of at least five species, but it's very common to see some of these species all around the UK. And we actually use some of these strange behaviors to try and identify these to species themselves. So for example, this, these individuals, if you disturb them, they contract to a nice little hump. They'll actually sometimes exhibit this defensive dance. Um, we're not really sure what the purpose of it is, but it, the idea is, the theory behind it is that maybe it is deterring a predator in some way. To be honest though, by the time these slugs have reached this level of maturity in this size, they have really thick rubbery skins and really, really thick sticky mucus. So they're quite unpleasant for most predators anyway when they've reached this kind of larger size. So you can see what the slug is doing here is it's kind of twisting and rocking its body from side to side, doing this little hypnotic movement. And they'll do this for quite a while as well once if they're disturbed. Okay, so I've already kind of given you a, a hint on a previous slide, but I would love to know how many species of slug do you think are found in Britain and Ireland? So Kieran's popped the poll up again. Yeah, again, it is anonymous, so please do vote. Don't worry about getting it right or wrong. The people are, um, it's a much, much more diverse range of answers here, I think we're getting in, so people are less sure yeah. of this one, I imagine. I've got it in my head, which I think it is. I'm basing it on the size of the book. <laughs> I actually didn't bring a book in the room with me today. I should have. Oh, yeah, I, I've obviously got one that I can. And while you're voting, why not um, purchase a copy of the slug guide from the FFT? <laughs> um, yeah. No, it's a great book, actually. Yeah, I will be mentioning that book again in a moment. Okay, this is the results we've got. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, so uh, some people were reading the slides. Fantastic. There are, in fact, around about 44 species of slug found in Britain and Ireland. So well done to everyone who guessed that. Um, fortunately, there are not 300. That would make my life quite difficult. Yeah, so we always say around about 44 because slug taxonomy is a bit of a mess, a bit of a nightmare at times. I will come on to that in a moment. Um, and there's some really interesting changes going on, but also more species arriving as well. Just one of those species is actually protected under law. This is both European law, but also it's inscribed in, enshrined in local law as well. Um, but it's quite an unusual species and it's only found on the Isle of Ireland within 
Britain and Ireland. So we wouldn't find it in England or Wales, I'm afraid, or Scotland. One of the things that's so exciting about working on slugs and studying slugs is that the slug species are constantly changing that we're finding within Britain. So when that FSC guide that Kieran's already mentioned was actually created in 2014, they did a huge amount of work going all around the UK, collecting slugs, looking at DNA, looking at morphology, and just figuring out what species are present in Britain. And from this work, they realised that actually there was 20% more species established and breeding in Britain than we'd realised beforehand. So this huge amount of slugs actually present that we didn't realise were here. What's incredibly interesting as well is that less than half of the slug fauna is considered native to Britain. However, I should point out that the definition of a native mollusk is very, very harsh. Um, you have to have been here since the last ice age to be considered native. So um, it, can be, it can be a little bit mean to say that something that maybe has been here for thousands of years is not native. However, many species are also appear to still be arriving in Britain and some are also changing range, possibly in response to things like climate, but also maybe in response to other species displacing them or competing with them. And there's actually several species, many species that were discovered in that 20% that very little is known about, including some that were new to science at that time. So really exciting group to be working with. Um, so although it's a small amount of species, it's also quite a challenging group to look at an exciting one as well. So these are the roughly 44 species uh, established in Britain. There are one or two that have appeared since this guide was created. I don't know if there's immediate plans to update it, but I'm sure at some point there'll be a new version coming out of this guide. Um, but looking at this, you can see that there, there is quite a diverse range of size, shape, and in some cases, color, but also some of them do look kind of similar to each other. So you can see why as a beginner, it might be a bit tricky to get to grips with how do you, how do you get started identifying these slugs? And just to evidence some new discoveries are still being made. So this is one example from 2016. This is not actually the UK's first semi-slug, but it is probably the fourth species of semi-slug um, to be known to be established in Britain. So these are quite interesting in that they actually carry these little reduced shells still on the tip of their tail. It's not functional. They can't pull their bodies into it like a snail can, which is why they're still cast as being a slug rather than a snail. Um, but yeah, this was actually found in some woodland in South Wales. But since then, I believe it's now actually been found in isolated sites in North Wales as well, which is really interesting. It's thought that maybe it came in um, on some trees that were being planted in this forestry area. And it's thought that it can't easily disperse into other surrounding areas. So it is interesting to know that other sites have popped up around the place. But as well as some new species coming in, we've also got um, changes in our known species as well. So I'm just going to talk very briefly about Stella Davies, who is this amazing slug biologist um, who unfortunately passed away in 20, 2008. She did a huge amount of work just carefully observing all the slugs in her garden over the years. And this actually led to the discovery of several new slug species, um, including one that I believe is currently being described as a species finally, um, because it took so long to actually get the evidence. She was a really prof prolific naturalist, but she wasn't great at publishing. So um, a lot of her discoveries have taken time to be formally recognized. But yeah, some really exciting stuff she discovered. So well worth looking her up um, as a female malacologist if you have the time. But there are also, of course, some slugs that are important um, in terms of conservation. So I've just highlighted three of those here. So at the top left here, we have the lemon slug. Um, this is very much an ancient woodland specialist. So it's only really found in ancient woodland sites. It's not tolerant of areas where ancient woodland's been removed. These have a really interesting um, life cycle in that they are very easily found during the autumn and winter months when they come to the surface of the soil to feed on their favorite food, which is the fungal fruiting bodies of various mushrooms. Particularly, they seem to prefer mushrooms associated with old trees, which probably explains why they're limited to ancient woodland sites. Um, the rest of the time of year, we don't see them at all. We have no idea where they go. The theory is that they're below the surface of the soil feeding on the fungal hyphae or the roots of the fungi, to put it simply. 
At the bottom there, um, we actually have complete contrast in size here. So the lemon slug is quite small. It's only a few centimeters long, but really interesting one to find. Whereas the ash black slug at the bottom here, again, it prefers ancient woodland sites or older woodland sites. However, it's a bit more tolerant of areas where woodland has been removed. This is actually Europe's largest slug species. It can reach up to 30 centimeters long in extreme cases. So really big, chunky slug. Um, but again, a really exciting, interesting one to find because it tends to mean that it is an ancient woodland habitat that it's in. Then on the right hand side, we have the only protected underlaw species. So this is the one I mentioned earlier, which is the Kerry slug, which is found on the Isle of Ireland. This is quite interesting and it's an acidic, an acidic habitat specialist um, and it tends to again prefer woodland sites. But it's doing quite well in Ireland actually. However, if you want to handle or study these, you need a special license. So again, interesting slug to, to have around. Okay, so now I have a quick three minute video I'd like to show you all. Um, hopefully this will work smoothly. And this will just give you a, a brief introduction to what you have to look at to get started with slug identification and how to actually photograph slugs for identification. Many of these found in gardens. While some species can cause damage to plants, many may also play beneficial roles in the garden. So knowing what species you have found can be helpful in understanding if these are potential friends or foes. In this video, we're going to talk about what features to look at on a slug to try and identify its species level. Most slugs have a similar body shape with a saddle-shaped fleshy area just behind the head called the mantle and a long tail section. Look at the mantle area to see whether there are any patterns like spots or stripes. Are the patterns regular or irregular? What colour is the rest of the body, particularly the tail area? Are there any markings on the body? What colour are they? Are they regular stripes, irregular blotches or spots? Or are the markings only between the body texture? Oh. Apologies. Let's see. If we Imogen, it, it, yeah. it, it might be worth yeah. unsharing your screen and then sharing again. And, and there's an okay. option to share sound. Let's try that, that again. On. Ah, yeah. OK, sorry about that. I've just just turned that on. So hopefully bear in mind, the music is very loud. So if you have headphones in, I do apologize. Watch out. <laughs> There are over 44 species of slugs present in Britain and Ireland, and many of these found in gardens. While some species can cause damage to plants, many may also play beneficial roles in the garden, so knowing what species you have found can be helpful in understanding if these are potential friends or foes. In this video, we're going to talk about what features to look at on a slug to try and identify it to species level. Most slugs have a similar body shape with a saddle-shaped fleshy area just behind the head called the mantle and a long tail section. Look at the mantle area to see whether there are any patterns like spots or stripes. Are the patterns regular or irregular? What colour is the rest of the body, particularly the tail area? Are there any markings on the body? What colour are they? Are they regular stripes, irregular blotches or spots? Or are the markings only between the body texture? Does the edge of the foot have a different colour? What colour is the sole of the foot? Is it all one colour or are parts of the sole a different colour? On the front of their heads, they have two sets of sensory tentacles. The top set usually contain the eyes. The colour of these tentacles can sometimes be helpful in species identification. The colour of slime that slugs produce can also be useful in identifying them to species. However, keep in mind that species can produce at least two different types of slime, one for everyday movement and one for defence. Often these are different in colour and texture. You can observe this by placing the slug on a piece of paper to see the mucus produced when they crawl. Gently rubbing the body sides with fingers or with a white tissue can reveal the colour of defensive slime. Not all slug species can be identified from photographs. 
Some species require dissection and examination of the gelatalia to be able to identify them to species level. However, this usually applies to a few groups of species. If you are submitting records of slugs or asking for help with identification, it's essential to provide photographs for a second opinion. It is important to take photographs with multiple views of each slug you want identified, so that any characteristics important for that group or species is captured. These views should include a side view showing the right-hand side of the slug with the breathing pore visible, a top-down view showing the top of the slug, a view showing the sole of the foot. It is best to take these pictures of the slug while it is actively crawling, so that all the colours and patterns are visible. Placing the slug on a sheet of glass or plastic and gently turning it over is one way of getting a good photo of the sole of the foot. Gently rolling the slug over is another simple way to get this image while outside. Okay, so the key points to take away from that video really is that slugs are right-hand sided. So it's usually useful to have a photograph of the right side of the slug um, to show all those characters that we might need. They can be quite difficult to identify from photos. So multiple views are definitely needed to help with that. Um, body color and pattern are often used for slugs as well. And slime color can also be quite useful for identification. So as it's stated in the video, um, you have this flashy saddle-like shape at the top, at the front of the slug here known as the mantle in most species um, and the tentacles and then the long tail here. Most action actually happens at the front end here. So you've got the breathing pore on the right and right next to that will be the genital pore, but also um, the anus in most cases. So they'll poop, eat, uh, breathe and reproduce from the same area on the right hand side of the head, which is very bizarre. However, there are some exceptions to this rule. So one group known as the shelled slug, the testicella species, they actually have this remnant of a shell which they carry on the tip of the tail and the mantle is actually reduced to a little area beneath that shell so that they have a completely different body shape compared to the majority of slugs. Um, these are actually really interesting slugs to find because they spend most of their lives beneath the, soil of the, sur the surface of the soil. So if you see these, do report them because it's really, really exciting to get records of this species group. Then we have a complete, complete anomaly known as the ghost slug, which is completely different from all other slugs in Britain. Um, it was first described in Britain, but it's actually originally from the Ukraine region. Um, its known range is constantly expanding, so do look out for this, this little white slug. Um, again, it doesn't have this fleshy mantle at the front of its body. It's been reduced to a little circle at the tip of the tail. It does have eye tentacles, but it doesn't have any eye spots. So it's thought to be actually be functionally blind. So it's very unlikely that they actually can see anything. Um, you can actually kind of tell these groups apart based on the position of the mantle. Um, so this lovely guide, you can find this online. So if you're keen to, to look at these slugs, you can actually find this guide. It's published by the National Museum of Wales. So if you do see these slugs, please do let us know. Um, the best way to do this is actually probably to submit your record to iRecord, where all records are checked by volunteer expert verifiers. So we've got uh, Chris at the top here and Ben at the, uh, in the middle there. And also I do some of the verifications on there as well in some cases. Any unusual records are again checked by Ben at the middle here, who is the national recorder for non-marine marine mollusk with the Conchological Society. They then double check all the records that come off I record, um, make sure everything's correct. And then they upload all those records to the MBN Atlas. So they're freely available to all the public researchers and local record centre for download. So if you're interested in doing anything to do with slugs, that's the go to place for data. So. Um, Moving on briefly to um, kind of a bit of the interesting question that I'm looking at. Um, so it's not just rare slugs that are interesting, it's also species that were thought to be very common. So the species on the left here is the yellow cell slug. It was once thought to be widespread across all of mainland England, Scotland and Wales. Um, however, when they came to produce the new identification guide to slugs, um, they actually could only find reliable specimens of this species in parts of um, Wales and also parts of Devon and England as uh, different areas of England within that region. So it seemed to have really reduced its range. So it seemed to be becoming increasingly scarce. What happened in the meantime was the green cellar slug was accidentally introduced at some point and recognized as being present in the 1960s. And it spread very rapidly and seems to be replacing the yellow cellar slug species. 
So this is where kind of my research comes in and where you can get involved. So we really want to have records of these species of slug to know where the yellow saddle slug is still clinging on and where it's being replaced by the green species. The nice thing about all these slugs is they're actually um, detrite of all species. So again, they don't really feed on live plant material. So they're quite a beneficial slug to have in the garden, but it's just quite an interesting question in terms of understanding the impact that some non-native species may be having on the slug fauna. So do get out there, take a look. They're relatively straightforward to recognize in that they have these green and yellow mottled patterned bodies, a bit like camouflage, and these bluish tentacles at the front of the slug here. This is quite a unique combination to these two species. They do look very similar to each other, but the yellow saddle slug can be identified from photographs because it tends to have this unbroken yellow line along the center of the tail here. So if you do spot these slugs, take a photo, um, let us know by going onto the website, um, which is rhs.org.uk forward slash slug survey. And uh, there's a link to the specialized iRecord form on there. So you could submit your sightings there. We've also included this handy little ID guide on that web page as well, which includes the leopard slug because we did have some people saying that they had seen them, but they thought they were just funny called leopard slugs. So you can kind of see the differences there. But of course, if you're keen to get out there and start looking at slugs, but you're finding it difficult and they are a difficult group to get to grips with, there are places you can go to ask for help. So there's a very active Facebook group known as the Land and Freshwater, Freshwater Mollusco of Britain in Europe. Um, there are loads of expert verifiers actually involved in that group, some international ones as well. They do like for you to have a go before you start posting pictures. So uh, please do have a little go. It's fine to be wrong in what you think it might be. That's not a problem. They really appreciate you making an effort. There's also loads of resources on there and directions to resources for identification as well. You're always welcome to tweet pictures at me. I love seeing photos of slugs. So if you do find any weird slugs and you want second opinions, please do tweet. I have two Twitter handles on there, which is my personal one, but also the Salah Slug Survey one. You can also go directly to the Conchological Society. So you can reach out to the non-marine recorder. Please do so, particularly if you find anything super exciting, like a ghost slug or a shelled slug, because those records are really valuable, particularly. And uh, the Conchological Society has recently started a Twitter page as well. This isn't directly monitored by Ben, but if you do tweet at that, it might uh, be shown to him as well at some point because he's not really a social media person. But of course, get out there and get started with one of these iconic species. They are relatively easy to identify, so that's great starter slug for recording. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. So. Um, what would be great if you could go back to that idea board that we started at the beginning of the talk and just tell me what you know about slugs now. I will post the link into the chat here now for you. So that's there. So feel free to take your time to fill that in. So thank you so much for listening to the talk and a huge thank you to everyone who's supported my research so far, particularly everyone who sent in records. And yeah, I'm happy to take any questions if we have the time. Okay, right. Um, so people are welcome to turn on their videos now. Um, we've got loads of questions in the chat, I've seen. Mm -hmm. But if anybody would like to ask a question in person, then um, raise your virtual hand, your little blue hand, and you can ask Imogen directly. So I think we'll go straight to Beck while people start raising their hands. Um, and we'll, we'll cover some of the priority questions first. Um, and then we might do a little bit of a speed round <laughs> to try and get some of them out of the way where we ask you to answer quite quickly. Uh, so Beck, what, have we got any burning questions? Yeah, we've got quite a few. Um, so one of the first ones came quite at the start. So you mentioned that some slugs are less of a pest than others in a garden. Would some slugs actually give a net benefit to a garden depending on their diet? 
Oh, that's a really great question. Um, yes, easily, I would have thought so. So there's certainly some species like the cellar slugs that we believe mainly feed on rotting plant material and very rarely actually feed on anything live. Um, so they would probably have a net benefit, I mean, certainly in terms of diet. Um, but I would argue that, you know, most slugs, even if they do feed on your live plants, they do have some benefit because they are an important part of the ecosystem as well. So it's very important to remember that they are a food source for huge amounts of slugs. The definition of a pest is essentially anything that reproduces really quickly and produces a huge amount of damage. Um, and in a garden setting, hopefully that's not happening too, too frequently. I hope that answered it. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, Beck, if you keep going with questions until somebody raises their hand. Yep, okay. So when slugs mate, will both partners be equally likely to have their eggs fertilized? Oh, yes. So um, not necessarily at all. So this is where the interesting kind of sexual arms race comes into play. So slugs actually have a special part of the genitalia known as the bursa duct, um, in which they can store sperm and actually digest sperm as well. So they can actually decide not to use a partner's sperm once they've mated with them successfully, and they can actually digest the sperm instead and use the nutrients for growth. So there is definitely um, a slight advantage and a slight warfare based based on different hormones being transferred. Um, some slugs have actually tried to get around this by creating things known as spermatophores. So these are special parcels. So the, the sperm's in kind of a special parcel, which basically prevents the sperm from being digested too quickly. But it's like, it, it's very much an arms race and things keep changing and sometimes you'll be successful and sometimes you won't. So there's all these different warfare methods. It's really interesting. Earthworms produce spermatophores as well, but you know, they do it for a different, it's also to cheat, but for a different reason. So that's really interesting. Oh. Yeah, uh, right. Okay. Uh, Beck will carry on. Nobody's raised their raised hand. Yep. So do slugs hatch out of their eggs as larvae or as miniature slugs? They hatch out as miniature slugs. Um, sometimes they will look exactly like miniature versions of the adults and other times they will change colour and pattern as they grow, which is why juvenile slugs are really, really difficult to identify to species at times. That kind of links to another question. So someone asked, how do slugs produce their colour? Ah, so this, um, so some of this will definitely be genetic in terms of that it's actually come through the genes, but there is definitely evidence to support that diet will also influence the intensity of colour um, and the colours that are expressed, but also environmental conditions are thought to um, change, affect the colours of slugs as well. So. Um, and you can kind of see this quite simply on some slugs you might see in the garden. So, um, for example, I feed a lot of the ones that I maintain in the lab carrot and they kind of look a bit more orange because of feeding on the carrot. Though interestingly, in some species, feeding them on carrot makes them less orange. So I'm not sure what the process is there. But yeah, lots of things that can influence slug like colour. Can you ID slugs based on photos or in the field or do you need to do a microscope dissection? Very much depends on the slug you are looking at. Some can be done from photos quite easily. So things like the cellar slugs, you just need to take a photo of those because most of those we can do from photos. Um, there will be rare exceptions where they look really weird and we would have to look at the genitalia to be sure. Um, but most slugs probably you can do from photos. However, some of the really common groups can be really challenging and you do have to resort to dissection. So those large ones I was talking about that were brown with the orange around the edge, quite often you do have to resort to dissection on those mainly because um, they can all hybridize as well, which makes things a complete nightmare taxonomically. So yeah, some groups you do need to dissect, others you don't. Um, I can see that Fiona has her hand up. So Fiona, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask Imogen your question. Yeah, I'd put a question in, but then I thought about it more and wanted to expand it. Is anybody doing any work looking at uh, the paras parasite load in slugs? I say this because uh, a guy, local to me who has hedgehog rescue he has a theory that uh, part of the problem he's finding with a lot of hedgehog rescues is that they've got a high parasite load nematodes and he was wondering whether there was an an increase in the parasite load on slugs yeah so slugs and snails can be a uh, host to a vast range of parasites actually um, we're not doing any work on it at the RHS because it's kind of outside our, our remit, but I do know that Cardiff University has done a lot of research in the past, particularly looking at um, slugs as vectors of lungworm, because um, they have been 
implicated in that. So they can be vectors of various parasites. And in fact, globally, some slugs and snails can actually be parasites of, uh, sorry, vectors in quite harmful parasites that are harmful to human health. So there are there is a huge amount of research going on globally looking at those kind of issues. Um, but yeah, very complicated. Uh, part of science to look at um, but it's kind of outside of my area of expertise I'm afraid but there's loads of information out there um, if you know where to find it so do take a look okay there is, thanks. there is research going on thank you Fiona thanks Imogen for the answer uh, I think back to the chat questions Beck we might have time for two more so pick the two best and <laughs> Fairly, okay. fairly, fairly quick to answer ones. Okay, so one of the first ones that came through is where do slugs house their central nervous system? Ah, yes. So they they um, have a kind of a simple brain-like structure known as the ganglion, which is basically a circle of nerves. And interestingly, it's a bit like a donut shape and the throat actually passes through the middle. Not really sure why. Um, so yeah, they kind of have this simple, simplified brain and most of the... the uh, information seems to stem from there and it's around the throat. Um, and a burning question is why is salt so harmful to slugs? Oh complicated one. Um, so it'll probably be mostly down to things like osmosis so you know slugs are very very reliant on moisture for survival and basically it seems that salt draws all that moisture out of them very rapidly um, to an extent where they can't survive. Um, I'm not a chemist so I'm afraid I don't know the specific process involved um, but I suspect it's probably something to do with the chemical composition of a slug's body and the chemical composition of salt as to why salt is so harmful so quickly to them. I can't imagine it's nice being covered in salt full stop. Oh, it's, it's horrendous. Uh, having done it once as a child when I was in a very in curious mood, it's it's quite shocking. I wouldn't recommend doing it because they do literally dissolve into a pile yeah. of goo very rapidly. Uh, I think we can squeeze one more question in there. Um, so what habitat are the cellar slugs found in and what type of slime do they have? So cellar slugs tend to be found in human disturbed habitats, so gardens in particular, which is why our survey particularly targets gardens. What's actually quite interesting is the yellow species is very strongly associated with human habitation. So it's quite common to find them inside things like houses, but also around gardens and places like that. Whereas the green species seems a little bit more exploratory, so it will also um, sometimes crop up in places like woodland more commonly than maybe the yellow species does. And that's one of the theories as to why it's maybe a bit more of the successful slug in this country is that maybe because it, it is a bit more tolerant of other habitats and it is able to spread into more natural habitats as well. Um, in terms of slime, they actually have very yellow slime, both species. And they actually have yellow slime when crawling as well as on the body. Okay, I've got one, one more question for you, Imogen. So obviously we've had a lot of all over the place weather at the moment. So is there any reason why everybody on this call shouldn't do a cellar slug survey of their garden today? No, there is no reason at all, because actually these species live for several years and they can be active all year round. We've even had some records come in in January and December before, which is when most slugs tend to be less active. So no excuse for not going out and looking and seeing if you can find any of these slugs around. They are quite nocturnal, so they're easier to find at night. So if you go out at night with a torch, they're easiest to find then. But you will also find them in the daytime in places like compost bins, under flower pots, under any heavy items that creates a nice, dark, wet environment, because they really don't like being out in the daylight. Okay, so there's no excuse yet. You've given us an absolutely fantastic free talk today. So we've got plenty out of you. Maybe what we can all give back is half an hour or so of our time this evening and do a quick survey of our gardens. And if everybody on this call did that today, it would be a record breaking month for Imogen in terms of the number of responses within a month. So that would be absolutely brilliant. Um, just yeah, a big thank you, Imogen. As always, your talks are brilliant. Um, Imogen is also one of our tutors on the BioLinks project and we're gonna be working with her to get some slow courses out there so we can take um, take the subject even further. Um, but yeah, on that note, I'm going to stop the recording.